Chapter 81, M, How It Began Once everyone was gathered around the table again, Samus went through all the introductions while Spike made breakfast for everyone. While interested glances were exchanged at each name, only two moments of real interest caught attention, both of which based in how Anthony reacted. The first was when Samus introduced Twilight as Spike's other mother. Hey, Anthony chuckled. You know, I always wondered what your type was, Sam. As Twilight tilted her head in confusion and Luna guffawed, Samus punched Anthony on his arm, hard. At that point, Spike came back from the kitchen with waffles for everyone, pausing behind Gandrita's chair to smile down at her, only to blush when she leaned up to kiss him on the cheek. Whoa, Anthony gasped out, surprised. When'd you two get lovey-dovey? I thought you couldn't stand how forward she was? Spike shrugged. We came to understand each other a bit better. Things change. Especially in our case, Gandrata offered with a chuckle, briefly turning into Anthony before changing back. That was just freaky, Anthony and Spike stated together. This seems to be an unusually large gathering, Adam commented, with several figures of obvious significance for this planet. But it seems a bit too relaxed for an official diplomatic event. Nay, Commander, Luna countered. Spike is as close to sister and I as family, so we came to hear his tales of adventure amongst the stars now that he has returned to us. I just stopped and cause everyone else was here, Discord offered. It's boring when they're all in one place somewhere I'm not. How far you got? Anthony asked curiously. Spike and Samus both lowered their eyes. Twilight was the one who spoke up. We just learned about ZB's destruction, she offered. Ugh. Anthony winced. Talk about a grim note. And talk about timing, Adam added. We arrived just in time to help tell the next mission, your second to last for the Federation. Isn't that an odd coincidence? Not really, Rundus countered. We arrived just in time to help tell about the phase conflict. That's a bit much to shrug off as coincidence, Adam countered. It almost seems, planned. He glanced towards Discord. What are you looking at me for? He asked, his voice filled with injured innocence. You're the only one here with the power to arrange this, Adam indicated. Police! Discord scoffed. I'm the spirit of chaos. Why would I do something so, orderly? Because no one would believe you would, so you could get away with it, Adam offered. Discord smirked widely. Well now, you're a clever one. But don't you think it's a bit much on my part to gather you all here from across the cosmos just for a reunion and story time? That's just silly. True, Celestia agreed. It's far too simple for your normal hijinks. What else are you planning? Aren't you overlooking the possibility that it might actually be coincidence? Discord offered. Discord. Fluttershy began, her tone of voice between encouraging, chiding, and motherly disapproval. Discord sighed. Cross my heart, he began, doing the motions, hope to fly, stick a cupcake in my eye, my only future plans involving all of you are to hear the rest of the story. Adam remained suspicious, but with everyone else present accepting this, he decided to remain silent. Samus then began the tale. Our first stop after Zebes was the nearest Federation outpost, she explained. Using that other beam augment as I did actually damage my suit, so I actually needed a tune-up before I could get a checkup. She lowered her eyes. It wasn't until later I would understand the significance when one of the scientists said they gave my suit a good cleaning. Did they try to harvest Metroid cells from your suit to clone, but end up cloning nearly everything you fought on Zebes, including Ridley? Scootaloo asked. When everyone looked at her, she shrugged. What? The space pirates abuse cloning. You can't tell me the Federation doesn't have it. And we've got two more maybe Ridley battles based on how many times Samus and Spike said they fought him, and only two more missions. He has to show up here somehow. Adam and Anthony both stared. How? Anthony tried to ask. Gamers, Spike replied, causing Anthony to nod in understanding and chuckle. That's exactly what happened, Scootaloo, Samus explained. Of course, I wouldn't find out about that for a few months. After reporting the results of the Zebes mission to the authorities, 
Spike and I decided to find some place to relax and detox. So we swung by Ether to see how things were going there with the rebuilding. It wasn't doing too well, Spike admitted ruefully. The Luminoth were busy debating exactly how to go about rebuilding their world properly. The major debate was about whether to try and rebuild Ether as it was before the conflict, or to try and live in Ether as it had become. But wasn't that mission three years before? Twilight demanded, having kept track of those details. How could they still be debating? According to Yumos, the Luminoth are long-lived, can last for a long time on little food, and are very patient, Samus explained, rolling her eyes. Not unlike the Chozo. By my estimates at the time, as long as they had enough rations and clean water, which they did, the debate would probably last a full decade. So we spent most of our time riding the thermals over Aegon Desert, Spike finished. Bureaucratic infighting was not our idea of relaxation. When we felt more at peace with ourselves, we left, Samus offered. Once out in space, we picked up, a rather unique distress signal. An SOS signal demanding immediate attention and aid from anyone who heard it. It was codenamed Baby's Cry. Spike snorted derisively. You have a problem with Federation protocols? Adam asked calmly. Nah, Spike countered. I just think it sounds like a bad joke that the baby's cry led us to the bottle ship. Rainbow wasn't the only one who snorted in disbelief, though she was the one that spoke. Seriously? Samus shrugged helplessly. Chapter 82, M, A Strange Friend in a Not-So-Strange Land So what happened on this, bottle ship, then? Shining Armor asked curiously before pursing his lips. Yeah, you're right Spike. That just does not have the epic sound one of these stories seemed to call for. Know what you mean, Spike agreed. Wasn't even all that great an adventure. Was still rather important, Samus commented dryly. For a variety of reasons. As Samus set the ship down gently aboard the bottle ship, she gestured for Spike to follow behind her. He obeyed readily, his claws clicking quietly against the metal walkway making less noise than her own boots, his tail lashing gently in the air showing the relaxed tension of his body. Samus kept her hand on her arm cannon, just in case she had to shoot something. Neither made a sound at first, waiting to see what would come. Before too long, Samus spotted another ship that had apparently landed in the dock some time before. A quick scan showed it had the Galactic Federation logo, but an explosion further and grabbed attention before either of them could investigate further. The pair quickly made their way to the source of the explosion, Spike shifting halfway to a speed boost shape so that he could run faster without actually triggering the biological reaction. Samus kept her own pace much the same. Shortly after the second explosion made the pair reconsider whether or not to actually activate a speed boost, they reached the source of the noise. Samus went into a diving roll as she brought her arm cannon to bear, while Spike leapt into the air to cling to the ceiling as he built up his flame. Across the room from them, a squad of Federation soldiers in standard issue power suits spun to face them, weapons primed. The whole tableau held, on the verge of hostility, until the largest of the troops stepped forward a bulky plasma cannon strapped to his back. Ah, fancy meeting you here, Princess. He called out in a comfortingly familiar voice. And the little prince too, not so little anymore. Where the muscles come from, ankle biter? He lifted his visor, revealing his wide grin. Uncle Tony? Spike asked in shock as his fire faded, relaxing as he recognized that this one, at least, was friendly. Samus herself returned to an at-ease posture as opposed to active combat. Anthony! Samus breathed in relief, plainly as glad to see the familiar figure as Spike was. Princess? Rainbow gasped out, snickering. You didn't tell us you were royalty! Twilight burst out, amazed as she turned to Samus. Her amazed expression turned to confusion when Anthony burst into laughter, and Rainbow only laughed harder. It's an affectionate nickname! Samus explained, rolling her eyes. Admittedly, I can see why you'd make that mistake, considering there are four of them here. Five, actually, Gandrita corrected. I don't make a fuss, but, yeah. My people have a sort of fusion between an oligarchy and a meritocracy, so I was slated for a position in the ruling class, 
in about 500 years when they decided I was experienced enough. And technically, as the last living representative of the Chozo on this plane of reality, and thus their sole living representative, you technically are one, mom, Spike corrected. Even if they never had a monarchy. Samus groaned as her hand met her face. Can we get back to talking about the mission instead? She groaned. From the sound of it, this conversation's going to be much more fun, Discord teased. Now, do we want to know about the rest of that unit beyond you knew them all personally apostrophe dot 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 or do they all wind up dead? Samus closed her eyes as the jocular atmosphere slowly faded. Let's continue. Haven't seen you since the last time I sat the ankle biter. Anthony greeted warmly as he stepped forward. And your buddy's here too. Samus hesitated as her eyes fell on Adam Malkovich, plainly the commander of this mission. A welter of emotion swamped her mind. On the one hand, he had been the closest to a father she'd had since leaving Zebes the first time. On the other, they, hadn't parted on the best of terms, and the less said about that the better, all things considered. And he never entirely approved of bounty hunters in the first place, let alone her decision to become one. What are you doing here? Adam demanded coldly. Noticing Spike bridling a little, Samus struggled to get herself under control. We picked up the distress signal, Samus explained firmly. We came to investigate. She knew why Spike might have taken offense to Adam's tone, but the commander had always been all business on missions. He never let his emotions get in the way of what had to be done. What brings you here? As Anthony started to speak, Adam cut him off. That information is not for an outsider, he stated bluntly. As most of the unit turned towards Adam in shock, Samus closed her eyes. His words had hurt, showing just how much damage she'd done to her relationship with the man with how they parted so long ago. Hearing Spike begin to growl as her suit detected an increase in heat, however, forced Samus to push that aside as she turned to give Spike a warning glance. While he didn't seem to be in a forgiving mood, his growling quieted. At that point, one of the other troops informed Adam that they were all prepped, and the whole unit pulled back. An explosive device attached to the large sealed door in front of them went off after Anthony had guided Samus back out of range. However, the door did not open. No dice, one of the other troops grumbled. I think our only option is to slowly cut our way through with the laser. The electrical system's out, Anthony explained to Samus, so we can't get the door open. And explosions are tricky without causing collateral damage. What we need is some way to focus the power on a centralized location. He shot Samus a wink. Samus rolled her eyes, knowing that it was an obvious hint to use her missiles. However, before she could, there was a loud crunch that made everyone spin. Spike had just put his clenched fist through the metal of the door, right where the explosion had been. Pulling his fist back, he gripped the edges of the hole he'd just made with both foreclaws and pulled. With a screech of twisting metal, a reasonable sized passageway had been forced open. You coming mom? He asked bluntly. Anthony whistled in appreciation. Well look who's got the big guns now, he teased, making Spike chuckle and flex playfully. Adam glanced briefly from Samus to Spike, then stepped forward. The Federation is handling this objective, he stated bluntly. We don't need any interference from outsiders. Spike snorted derisively. Well, I came here in response to a distress beacon, so I'm going to look for whoever sent it to offer rescue. Interfere with our objective, and we will treat you as hostile, Adam continued firmly. Spike gave a cursory look at the unit's armaments as the other soldiers tensed before snorting defiantly and getting into a combat stance. And if your entire arsenal could even so much as scuff my scales, I might be the slightest bit intimidated. He barked back. Samus quickly stepped forward before it could devolve further. Spike, enough, she snapped. Stand down. Much to her surprise, Spike immediately obeyed. Turning to Adam, she gathered her thoughts, trying to figure out how to smooth this over. Commander Malkovich, I recognize this is not a mission posted for any hunters. However, I find myself concerned for any civilians on board. My abilities and arsenal are available at no charge should you choose to avail yourself of them. Adam stared at her for a time, then nodded. You remember the regs? 
he said coldly. Yes sir, Samus confirmed, using mental commands to disengage some of the more advanced tech in her power suit, reverting back to the basic setup, though leaving the rest to be activated at need. Then stick to the objectives, and keep them under control, Adam directed firmly. Yes sir! Samus confirmed. She wasn't sure if she imagined the approving smirk under his faceplate as he turned away, but it quieted her roiling emotions either way. Samus paused, noticing a lot of hostile glances being directed at Adam's way from the pony members of her audience. The only one not looking at him with some degree of hostility was Twilight, and she was looking at Spike in concern. Why do you react with so much hostility, Spike? She asked worriedly. I, honestly don't know, Mom, he replied softly. It's just, the moment I laid eyes on him, I felt insecure and angry. I felt like I had to assert myself, to let him know I wasn't afraid of him or his dinky little guns. And yeah, that actual thought crossed my mind. It didn't fade until Mom told me to stand down. He glanced towards Samus, his eyes confused. Instincts, Adam replied reasonably. Samus is Spike's alpha, so when my presence caused her emotional state to become confused, Spike's instincts decided I was a threat, and compelled them to clash with me. It's why I pushed the conflict. It both forced Samus to realize how much her emotional stability affected Spike's self-control, and compelled her to bring her own emotions under control, which was to the benefit of the mission. She'd hardly function at her best as an emotional wreck. Celestia pursed her lips in a somewhat disapproving frown. I'm not sure that was the best way to handle it, she murmured. It worked, Adam replied firmly. If Spike had been human, I'd have handled it differently. But even with how well he thinks and how well developed his emotions are, he's an animal. Noticing several unpleasant reactions to that statement, he continued, I mean that as a compliment, of course. Pray tell, elaborate, Luna requested curiously. Humanity left behind being animals ages ago, Adam explained. We traded it away, along with our older instincts, in exchange for our reliance on technology, civilization, and other such things. While many feel this is proof of human superiority, I feel it has left us a weaker species overall. From what Samus talked about with the Chozo, I say they agreed with you, Anthony offered. Weren't their biggest teachings about balancing nature with the development of technology? That's right, Samus confirmed. With that attitude, you'd have probably fit right in with them, Adam. An odd view to take for someone of your rank, however, Gore offered. The only logical view, in my opinion, Adam countered. I've lost count of the number of stories I've come across where someone was saved from becoming an unwitting victim of a psychotic or a sociopath because their pet dog sensed something fundamentally wrong with the individual in question that their owner could not, responding to it with uncharacteristic hostility. Don't mention that sort of thing, please, Spike pleaded, rolling his eyes. Remembering Sir Nivor? Adam asked, his voice as calm as ever. Eh? Pinky asked, confused. A rather eccentric billionaire who believed that the truest expression of humanity was a hunt, Gore explained. He challenged anyone to best him in the true hunt. It was speculated he also imported rare and exotic, especially endangered, species specifically to dine on them. An absolute scoundrel, but unfortunately, he was careful to make sure he never did anything actually illegal. And then when Spike was 13, he arranged to redirect him to one of his hunting grounds, with every intent of making him his latest delicacy, Adam explained. And he was never heard from again. What happened to him, anyway? Anthony asked curiously. He didn't taste very good, Spike replied. Samus stared at Spike, stunned, and she wasn't the only one. You didn't. She began. Spike shrugged. Meat is meat. Once it's dead, what does it matter what it was while alive? Luna tilted her head, curious. Then, you would not find it objectionable to dine on, say, any pony here after they died? Actually, I think I'd want to, Spike explained simply. I mean, now that I know doing so kept Squishy alive inside me, I wouldn't want to lose anyone I care about for eternity. Eating them after they die, it's just making them a part of me forever, he chuckled. 
Not that I'd ever dream of doing anything to hasten that day. I enjoy spending time with everyone too much. Is everyone relaxed? Adam smirked. How very Martian of you, he said idly. Glancing around at the relaxed faces of the ponies, he shook his head in amazement. All of you. So you really want to eat me someday, huh Spike? Rainbow teased. Well, a creature's diet affects the flavor of the meat, so maybe if you drank a little less cider and ate your veggies, Spike countered teasingly, startling laughter from several listeners. How come I'm the only one even close to wigging out over Spike talking about eating his friends? Anthony asked Adam. Because everyone else here is far more civilized than we are, Adam replied easily. They know Spike's in no rush to, as Heinlein said, grok them in fullness before they've reached their fullness. Huh, Anthony replied thoughtfully. Well, Scootaloo spoke up expansively, I don't know about the rest of you, but if I'm gonna achieve fullness, I need some more nachos. As those gathered laughter groaned as was their want, Spike headed to the kitchen with a chuckle to make more snacks. Chapter 83, M, Regulations Once the nachos and other snack foods had been prepared and served, Samus and Spike wasted no time getting back to retelling the adventure. As Adam's unit moved ahead, Samus followed, Spike close at her heels. The corridors were drab metal and exposed circuitry, typical of Federation function over form design preferences. The lighting was poor, but that proved no problem for either hunter. Samus Hood had its own built-in lights, and Spike could see in the dark better than Samus could in the light. He proved this when his head snaked forward, snapping up a large insectoid creature that attempted to bumrush Samus off the platform bridge they were crossing. Spike pulled his head back, crunching the creature up in his jaws before swallowing, licking his lips. Slimy yet satisfying, he offered cheekily. Samus frowned. No more Disney movies for you, she chided with a roll of her eyes. Samus paused in the retelling as she waited for Anthony to stop laughing. She felt sorry that few of the others around the table would get the joke. Once Anthony had calmed down, due to Adam giving a quiet cough and a glare, Samus continued the tale. Other wild creatures they recognized, zoomers and street bats, attempted to waylay their path, but Spike readily recognized them as some of the tastier creatures he'd eaten, and decided to take a few snacks. Few continued to trouble them for long after he charged forward. By that time, Adam's unit had moved far ahead of the pair, and they were in a rush to catch up. In the larger chambers, Samus leapt to Spike's back and let him fly her to the exit while she guarded his back. The oppressive atmosphere continued to weigh on Samus, though Spike seemed right at home. Before long, they came across a navigation chamber, the newer models of Federation communications ports. In addition to restoring suit shield energy and sending logbook data back to the ship, it also replenished ammunition and boosted communications channels so that coordination was possible in areas where constant communication with allies was impossible. After taking a few moments to send the data, Samus led Spike past the chamber and across another hallway, catching up with Adam and the others. They found them standing around the dead body of a scientist, his flesh and clothing torn, and stained with something green. After a time, the body shook, and a pink creature resembling an overlarge rhinoceros beetle crawled out, whether from inside him or under him was uncertain. Get away from me! One of the soldiers shouted as it got too close, getting ready to kick it away. Before he could, Spike zapped the insect with his ice breath, taking hold of the creature. Anyone know what this is? He asked, holding the frozen specimen. It's not in the ship databanks, as far as I can recall. I'll take it for analysis, Adam replied, holding out his hand. After a nod from Samus, Spike handed over the specimen. At that moment, a swarm of the creatures began crawling out of the walls and up towards the ceiling of the massive chamber. Adam immediately ordered everyone to prepare for combat. The soldiers lowered their face plates as the creatures surrounded a large eyeball that lowered towards them before dropping to the floor amongst them, taking the shape of a large beast with two long tentacles for limbs. Open fire! Adam ordered, and the entire group began firing. Samus utilized her power beam to aid, while Spike tried his flame breath. However, the assault wasn't proving very effective. The weapon's discharge was bouncing off the creature amalgamation. This isn't working. 
One of the troops shouted. Ice worked! Anthony pointed out. Freeze guns authorized! Adam ordered, and the entire group switched their autofire pistols out for handheld cryogenic pistols. Samus, missiles authorized! Samus nodded as she reactivated her missiles, recognizing the strategy Adam wanted to use. Spike, meanwhile, joined in with his ice breath. While Adam's unit focused on freezing one part for Samus to shatter with a missile, Spike focused on a different part, as a focused discharge from him was enough to create the desired freeze effect, and a charging punch the shattering blow. When the creature amalgamation finally fell over, the eyeball was revealed to be a much larger beetle like the others, which Spike was quick to smash, causing the other beetles to disperse. Everyone okay? Anthony called out, getting affirmatives all around. Once everyone had calmed down, Adam began a debriefing for everyone. Exactly what transpired here on the bottle ship is still uncertain. Here's what we do know, the equipment we thought had been destroyed is operational again, and we've seen casualties attributed to an unidentified and lethal creature. The situation is critical. We need to gather all the information we can, the priority one is to find any survivors and bring them to safety. Consider this site extremely dangerous. Be careful as you make your sweeps. And there's one problem. Just one? Spike muttered as the troops raised their heads to listen. His snark earned him a glower from Samus. The wireless interference in this facility is all pervasive, Adam continued, the slightest twitch of his mouth is only reaction to Spike's aside. Your comm systems are useless. As a result, communication channels will be limited to the facility's navigation chambers. He then proceeded to give each of the troops their orders. Anthony was sent to Sector 3, and given permission to use his heavy plasma cannon at his discretion. Samus and Spike were ordered to the system management room, and to do everything they could to get the electrical systems up and running again. Apparently, Samus' comms were still functional for some reason, which would prove an advantage in directing her. Adam also authorized the use of her bombs, but not power bombs, as they were too dangerous when they were trying to find survivors. With one last caution to everyone to be careful, Adam declared the briefing over. Samus felt somewhat ill at ease. Despite having her aid accepted, she felt like she was still somewhat excluded as the troops gave the traditional thumbs up. But then Adam turned to her. Any objections, lady? Smiling under her helmet, she gave her usual thumbs down, before turning to follow the mission objective. As Samus paused in her retelling, Celestia turned towards Adam. Do you think, you might have been a little cold with her? She asked softly. I knew Samus' story, Adam explained firmly. If I'd ever approached her too openly or with too much friendliness as a superior officer, she'd have distrusted me or pushed me away. When she was first in my command, she wasn't ready to accept connection with others again, after what had happened in her past. At the bottle ship, Returning to the way we've related before was repairing a broken bridge. It may seem cold to you, but it was what Samus needed. He carefully sipped his tea. I take it you yourself have frequently been in a position like that. Yes, Celestia replied. I've taken many personal students, and done my best to help them grow into whatever awaits them. Twilight is my most recent student, and the one I'm most proud of. Twilight couldn't help but blush at that. And do you use the same approach with every student? Adam inquired further. Or do you adjust it for each one? Celestia blinked in surprise. Well, I do try to tend to each student's unique needs, but overall I try to maintain the same sort of relationship with each. And has that ever resulted in things going wrong, and those students rejecting you? Celestia glanced away. I'll take that as a yes, Adam replied. I mean this is no sinecure. Merely making a point. Not everyone responds the same in a situation. I took the approach my interpretation of events said Samus needed. From what happened, I can say I guessed right. I, see your point, Celestia allowed. 